a pleasure um, to talk to modelers and mathematicians. I really get to talk to mathematicians, though I've worked briefly with one or two. Um, so this is this is really a very nice opportunity for me, and I thank you for it. Um, for those of you who, uh, as you suggested, are from completely different backgrounds, like the mathematicians, I'm a geographer, basically. Um, but most of my geography has been done via simulation modeling. Um, and I work in Canada, in Newfoundland, which is, um, you'll fly over if you fly from Western Europe to New York, about three hours before you land, you'll fly right overhead. I'll wave at you. Um, <laughs> So, uh, but a lot of my work I actually I do in Europe because there is much more interest in modeling there than there is in North America. In North America, there's very little, it's sort of shocking how little there is. And of course, there's even more interest in China because they have many of the problems that of urbanization that really can be helped by you know, a strong modeling base. So that's, that's a little bit of my background. Um, maybe I should go now to the um, presentation. I, I have a PowerPoint here. Um, uh, let me just share screen. Uh, you, uh, Luca, you've disabled the uh, screen sharing. <laughs> uh, yes, let me see a moment. There we go. Thanks. Okay, good. Um, well, uh, the, the title is, as you can see, Open Futures, Predictability and Time in Urban Systems. That doesn't mention mathematics, but the mathematics is hidden in there, and I'll come to that. But there's also more than mathematics involved here. I also will be talking about algorithms um, in, a, in a way that's probably unfamiliar to most of you. Um, so really what I'm going to be talking about today is, is what we might call meta issues in urban modeling. These are the issues that arise in when you're doing urban modeling and many other types of modeling. In fact, any modeling, any human or ecological systems, I would say these meta issues arise. Um, and these are important issues, but they are largely ignored, partly because some people don't even see them and partly because um, the people who do see them are terrified by some of them and don't know how to handle them. So it seems much safer just to pretend they don't exist. Um, I've become aware of these issues because unlike most people in, in modeling, uh, I have been involved in modeling urban systems for 50 years, um, actually more than 50 years. And for about 30 of those years, I've been involved with the same group of people, um, first in Maastricht and then we moved to Belgium, um, developing um, a, a very elaborate um, uh, integrated model of a generic model of urban systems and, and regional systems. Um, and so with this sort of intensive background over a long period of time, many, many issues begin to, to bubble up into your awareness that wouldn't be evident if you're simply spending a year or two developing a particular model um, and then maybe be working with it for another year or two. So that's, that's the background of what I'll be talking about today. Um, let me just start by referring to a, 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 a scheme of uh, Lucas, which I was quite attracted to when I first saw it, um, the, the, his ISO benefit city. Um, and this is, it, one of the reasons I was attracted to it is it reminds me a little bit of the city I live in and that it, it, it shows that it's possible to have a city with very close access to nature. Um, and that's what we have here in, where I live not because of good planning, not because of modeling, but simply by the fact that the city has been poor and slowly growing and is highly constrained by its um, topography and its weather, climate, um, soils. And so, um, but, but Luca is advocating this would be a, a, a wonderful sort of urban environment to live in with small but intense urban communities um, so that they're walkable and uh, but surrounded by nature and a whole network of these comprising the metropolitan system means that you have all the advantages of a very large city but also all the advantages of, of a, a small intense town site um, now he's also developed a model of the, the, the schema and when you see there's some images from what the city might look like um, uh, 
but he's also developed a model that, that will generate endless varieties of this, of this um, ISO benefit uh, urbanism. The question here is, um, we, we, what does this model really show? It shows, first of all, that, that there is a process that would generate such a city, um, but that's because that's what he's, he's done. He's written an algorithm which embodies a process that generates um, maps of such a city. Um, but the question is, would, does this process in the algorithm really represent a process, the process, the fundamental processes that go on in a real process of urbanization? If we look at almost any cities anywhere, um, for example, well, here you see twice, you see London, once at Nice, you see Vancouver in the west of Canada, you see a small um, medieval city near Bern, Switzerland, and you see Caral in, in Peru. When we look at these images or any other sort of overview, like a map, so to speak, of a city, we immediately recognize it as a city. They're very, very different from each other, all of these places. And yet we immediately think, oh yes, it's a city. Uh, and that suggests there's something generic in any city, that there's some underlying common process that in spite of the variety and idiosyncrasies we get from one city to the other, there really is something common in all of them that is captured by whatever process it is that generates them. So on the one hand, we have visions, and uh, that's the, um, uh, on the left you see um, Luca's vision, uh, and we have reality. On the right, you see uh, the reality in Flanders, Belgium, which is an area we're currently working in. Um, and there you see a little uh, strip development along a rural road. That's extremely common in Flanders. Um, and below that, you see, the, uh, in a sense, the reality. But it's also, it, it, because we, if you start at the beginning, you'll see actually it's a model that's running, but you don't, at that scale, see much change. Um, at the beginning, it's the actual land map of Flanders or part of Flanders there, but as it runs, it generates a possible future for Flanders. So um, the reality is that, that people in that region of Belgium are panicked now because they realize that in a hundred years or less, at the rate the region is urbanizing, there will be no rural areas left at all. So they have adopted a scheme they call um, Betonstoppa, uh, which is basically Dutch for stop the concrete. And the idea here is that um, the um, all urban development after about 2040 will occur either on brownfield sites or through densification. So there'll be no additional taking of rural land. Um, that's a pretty um, ambitious target and I doubt that it'll be met. But uh, in support of that, then they have um, come to us for a model that will help them um, decide how to do this. And so the point of the model is, then is to help them explore what the impact of various policies might be. Policies like changes in the transportation infrastructure or um, changes in building regulations, densification regulations, that sort of thing. Um, uh, to see to what degree this would help um, in stopping the concrete and also what the cost might be of various of these issues. So what I want to talk about briefly now is just describe that model. Um, it's actually the same generic model we've been developing, as I said, for some um, 30 years. Um, uh, and the reason I want to describe it briefly is just because most of what I'll be talking about today, these meta issues are very abstract sort of problems. And I think in order to avoid just a lot of hand-waving, philosophical hand-waving, I would like to ground these meta issues in actual situations and in particular in actual models. And that's so that I'll do that at several times during this talk. I'll refer to particular models as, as a way of grounding some of the meta, meta issues that arise out of the models. So in this particular model, which is a cellular automaton, um, we have a cell state, but instead of being just as in many land use models, urban or rural, it's um, a whole vector. And that vector holds the land use, but it also holds the quantity of each activity that we're modeling. And this model handles 35 land uses and eight activities, one of which is population, the other seven of which are employment in various economic sectors. So we include demographics and economics. And the cell space, unlike most cellular automata, is not homogeneous, so that each cell has a vector of intrinsic characteristics. Um, and these represent things like physical suitability, like the soils, whether it's flooding or not, um, 
or slope and the legal status are you allowed to develop it or what can you are allowed to do there accessibility to the transportation network and so on and then for the cell neighborhood unlike a regular a normal cellular automata which usually has a von neumann or a, or a moore neighborhood which is the four or eight cells immediately surrounding a cell being defined as the cell neighborhood here we define the cell neighborhood to be the entire modeled area because we recognize that what's going on anywhere in the region you're modeling can affect any cell in that region. So we want to be able to take into account the effects of all cells on any particular cell. Um, obviously, the further away the cell is, the less impact it has. So there's a distance decay phenomenon included in there. Um, and that also brings in things like transportation networks that allow you to communicate from one cell to the other. So the, uh, just to see what this sort of looks like in a schematic way, the um, land use is an expression of activity so that the land use um, depends on the population and the employment in the cell. If, if most of the population there is actually living there, we call it a residential cell, um, but it has a density as well, um, depending on how many people live there. If most, but it also may have employment, um, but probably if it's residential, not much of employment. Um, but if the dominant, um, uh, activity there is employment uh, in, say, the retail sector, then it becomes a commercial um, land use and also has um, all the other activities in principle in there. And then uh, these, all these other things also affect the activities that will settle in a cell, the accessibility to the transportation network, the natural environment, legal constraints, the infrastructure in terms of the transportation system, uh, communication networks, sewers, that sort of thing, water networks. Um, so all these things affect what goes on in a particular cell in the cellular automaton. And putting it all together, uh, one iteration of this model would look like this. We start by calculating a neighborhood effect for each cell, which shows how what goes on and is likely to go on in that cell at the next time period depends on what is going on right now in all the other cells. Um, we put in these cell characteristics of that particular cell, this inhomogeneity in the cell space. Um, we calculate a transition potential for activities, um, how much populations are going to attract, how much um, uh, employment in each sector will it tend to attract. And that gives us, along with target densities, which are actually not targets, but um, densification zones um, specified by the government under this Beton stop a program, that allows us to predict the activities of the next time period. And knowing the activities, and also taking into account inertia and just economies of agglomeration, um, I should just mention that inertia because there's a cost of changing a cell state. Um, so that tends to be delayed. Um, and there's also this effect of ex negative externalities as the economists call them, that if a location is particularly good, it will attract a lot of activity. Um, but if it attracts a lot of activity, you end up with extra costs in terms of high land prices and congestion and that sort of thing. So these are disincentives that, that emerge in the, what would otherwise be the most attractive areas. So taking into account all of these things, we calculated transition potential for land use and that from that get the land use at the next time period. So this model is stuffed with mathematics because the neighborhood effect includes the distance decay effect, for example, in the weighting equation and the inertia and diseconomies um, in terms of all equations, there's a stochastic perturbation that um, is a quick and dirty way of representing the fact that all of the underlying agents of the system, that is the individual people, have different tastes as to where they would like to live. And different businesses have different requirements, even though they may all be called um, industry or retail. So the thing is, though, here that this model is, even though it has all its mathematics in it, it's actually the mathematics is better than an algorithm. So it's basically algorithmic executing in time. And that allows it ultimately to transcend the mathematics. Now, that's probably a weird thing to say at this point. And so I'm going to come back on it. I'm really just setting that up to talk more about later. So here are four meta issues in modeling. The first one is pretty simple. Um, maybe it's really not very meta. Um, make the model realistic. Um, 
I list this as a as a meta issue because most models, especially CA models that are made of land use, are not realistic. Um, I get hundreds of papers every year to review for journals that are somewhat by someone who has downloaded some land use data from satellites and then done a applied some calibration technique to calibrate as, as a two land use urban and rural cellular automata to it and voila there's a, a CA land use model um, but these things are not really very realistic and not very useful and what's worse is they don't really build on each other so there's no progression in modeling if you simply do the same sort of exercise especially if it's a very simple and realistic one over and over again um, so the idea here is to employ as much relevant domain knowledge as possible in whatever you're modeling and we've already seen that and uh, also you should make the model easy to couple to other models and so for example it's obvious that this land use model uh, activity model that I was just talking about could be and has been coupled to transportation models to create a full LUTI model that is a land use transportation interaction model because the two are obviously work very closely together in reality the transportation heavily affects land use and activity location and vice versa so the second um, meta issue then is go for hardwired multidisciplinarity um, and here's an example from an application of this model in a larger European project, still a small European project, but um, involving several countries and several domains, um, weather and climate modeling, groundwater modeling, and then our land use and activity models. Um, the idea was to do, uh, learn something about um, the possible effects of changing climate in Europe um, as it might affect groundwater. Um, and so here's sort of a schematic of part of this model, integrated model that was developed. Um, first, there were scenarios on future droughts. And second, this was fed into an agricultural activity model, which involved both crop growth models coming from agricultural experts and an economic models having to do with possible price prices for various um, agricultural products. And that model then predicts um, demands for various crops and so on. And then the land use and activity model that's allocated to, to particular parcels of land in the cellular automata model. And depending on what's on the, on growing on each parcel of land and what time of year it is, um, whether it's there because it's winter or because I've just been plowed or it's you know the end of summer and there's a lot of coverage of vegetation, that we get can calculate infiltration and runoff rates. Um, and then on the basis of that, um, that affects the groundwater um, that goes into the groundwater bottle. On the urban side, urban expansion obviously affects um, agriculture by taking away land from agricultural activity, and it also increases impervious services, surfaces, which will um, reduce groundwater recharge. And then, of course, there are feedbacks in the other direction that the groundwater drought affects agriculture because a lot of agriculture is irrigated by the groundwater and it affects urban development because much urban um, water use, and especially industrial water use comes from groundwater. So um, these um, models of land use, land cover activity provide really an ideal um, platform for integrating models of, of all sorts of phenomena because almost everything happens somewhere. It's just, and so rather than dealing with averages like over an entire country or region as economists typically do, we get down to the details of specifics and this makes the results much more um, realistic, but also typically more accurate. Um, and most real world problems obviously involve a variety of factors and these factors are studied by a variety of disciplines and in their practical and their amount is by a variety of institutions, both corporate and governmental. Um, and this means that we need to understand these systems, as integrated systems, but um, mostly they're studied in separate disciplines which don't talk to each other. Um, and so it's a real advantage to be able to um, develop a model which um, couples models from several different disciplines because once that happens, the disciplines are forced to deal with each other directly and in a serious manner because if their models are coupled to someone else's models, that means 
they have to take into account what the other people are, are studying in a, in a direct and serious way, a quantitative way. And funding opportunities are often directed towards multidisciplinary projects because people do recognize that this is the way we have to go. However, um, there are cultural problems involved. Most people involved in integrative um, or multidisciplinary projects really join just because they want to get the funding. And once they've got the money, they will then take it and develop their own model and try not to talk to the other members of the group. And so in the end, they typically produce um, separate reports. And then in order to fulfill the funding requirements, it has to be a comprehensive project report. And that's usually some unfortunate person is uh, tasked with writing an integrative summary. And then all the individual project reports are stapled together behind the um, integrative summary um, by a heavy duty stapler. And in fact, there was no real integration at all. So that's the common problem with these. Um, and this I know this from experience in a number of large multidisciplinary projects. Now, verification and validation. Um, these are getting into more serious now meta issues. Um, these are very difficult problems. Um, the standard procedure here is we assume the model structure is correct. That is, we ignore verification. I'll ignore that too, just for the sake of time today. Um, we need to calibrate, and we then typically calibrate over one time period, say from time T1 to T2. Um, these two endpoints are where we have data, actual data. And so we calibrate from one data set to the other. Um, and then with luck, we have data for a third time, and then we then can validate by running the model from the second time period to the third and see how well the model output um, for that third time period uh, accords with the actual data. Um, so this seems quite straightforward. This is what people do, but there are real problems hidden in here. First of all, um, and I'm not going to talk about this really in detail, what should we compare? Should we compare pixels? This is the most common thing, but it's also the least adequate because when we're talking about the future, we never know exactly where something will happen. We really only care, are we getting the general pattern right? We don't know that this house is going to be built here rather than 50 meters down the road, but we do want to know, are there going to be houses built in this little area? Um, and so that gets us more towards pattern-based comparisons. And this is an area which needs a lot of development. Um, and we've been involved in some of this, but there we need much more. Um, some of these pattern-based techniques are, are, are polygon-based and others are like the frag step measures coming from ecology, which are widely used. Those are also, those are actually very useful measures for many things. Um, uh, but there are many other qualities of patterns that are not currently captured by, by any techniques for map comparisons, uh, which is what we need when we're validating a model. And then the, another the even bigger problem is when should we optimize or when should we not optimize the fit between the model and the data? It seems at first glance that of course we want to optimize the fit, but that leads immediately to, or may lead to over calibration, which is a recognized problem, but nobody quite knows what to do with it once they've recognized it. So here's an example from, um, of this problem. It's sort of an extreme example, but it was concocted to, to make the point very clearly. It comes from Dan Brown's paper in the IJGIS in 2005, um, which I recommend highly. Um, let's sort of take a God's eye view here for a moment. We have this model, um, or maybe God has the model, uh, and it's a model that involves all the laws necessary to generate a universe. And so if you run the model, um, you generate a universe, which you see a picture of there on the left, that's labeled a single run. If you run it again, you generate another universe, and there you see it on the, in the middle panel. And if you run it many, many times and overlay all the results, you sort of see the composite results. So they sort of average, you know, all the universes there, which you see on the right. So that's, that's what God can see. But now let's talk about us. Um, we're, we don't have the model, but we are now modelers, some of us. And so we decided to develop a model of the world we observe. And let's say we're really brilliant modelers and somehow or another we manage maybe just good blind luck to come up with exactly the model that God used to generate our world. So, um, but 
the problem is we have the structure of the model, we have all the equations, but we don't know the values of the parameters in that model. So we think, well, no problem. We do have a data set. They're the ones shown reality, what we can observe. And we'll just calibrate using that. So we calibrate it. Um, and when we calibrate, we get a single run and it looks pretty much like our reality. So we say, oh, this is a pretty good model. If we run it many times, we then see that it always, it doesn't always, but it usually ends up giving us something like what we observe. Every once in a while, it gives us something down there in the Southeast and we think, well, no model is perfect. But in fact, if from what God can see is that we've over calibrated the model. We don't have really, um, we've, we've generated, so we'll observe, it will, gen, it, it will tell us that that really the universe generates configurations that will appear in the Northwest, whereas God knows it will, this is with an equally likelihood generate ones in the Southeast, but we miss that because you've over calibrated. How do we deal with over calibration? Well, that's um, a problem which hasn't fully been solved. One way is to um, identify stationarity in the system. That is something that uh, long-term regularity uh, typically, these are fractal dimensions with spatial systems like a cluster size frequency distribution of, say, um, land use patches of some sort of like commercial areas. Um, and detune whatever calibration we've optimized so that we maintain these um, long term relationships. Um, so we calibrate, in other words, against several different data sets. Um, and what we find if we do the normal calibration based on just simply land use, um, uh, we very typically over calibrate and, and we see this by finding that, that fractal dimensions, which typically um, are constant over long periods, um, don't turn out to be constant in the, in the calibrated model. So then we know we've over calibrated. So um, this over calibration problem is really a symptom of the fact that um, the real world has open futures. And in fact, the models that we build, if they're gonna be realistic models, have to have open futures as well, but they have to be able to generate many possible futures because many futures are possible. Um, and this whole problem is also a problem for validation. These open futures are schematized by bifurcation diagrams. And here's a bifurcation diagram. Um, in the mathematical sense, these, which is where they, I guess, originated, um, they schematize the solutions to an equation or a set of equations as you change some variable in the equation or some parameter, I should say, in the, in the, um, in the equation. Um, I've less of the variable, the, the parameter that's changed here is time on the x-axis. And then that change, then we see that we graph the system state, which is some measure of system, uh, the system on the y-axis. Um, and so what this shows is that as you um, increase the value of some parameter from left to right, initially you have only one solution to the equation, then, then beyond a certain parameter value, you get two solutions, and then beyond another one, you get four and so on. These may be different solutions, or they may be different types of solutions, like going from a steady state to an oscillatory state with two periods to one with four periods and so on, ultimately chaotic behavior. So this is sort of an ex a visual expression of what can happen with an equation. Um, if we think about this as representing an urban system, then um, we're thinking about what typically happens over time. Um, but we can just as well relabel the time axis as the energy axis because human systems, urban systems, like all human systems, really um, have historically used more and more energy. The energy density of these systems has increased and that has allowed them to become more and more complex, more and more elaborate. And as system state, we, if we're talking about an urban system, we can use a system state, some measure of say the city size, or if we're talking within a city, the, the size of some, um, particular feature like um, a retail center. Uh, so for the, um, at the left there, before we get to point A, we're in a very sparsely settled area, perhaps like Western Canada a hundred years ago or more, 125 years ago, where there were little towns more or less identical scattered all over the place. So any one town uh, 
um, was pretty well identical to every other town. Um, and so there was sort of one system state available um, if we're looking at, at these um, towns. Beyond a certain, but as the population density increased, um, wealth increased, in other words, as the amount of energy being used in this area increased, there came a point at which the variety of goods that could be provided and bought within the region increased to the point where the system became unstable and bifurcated. And two solutions are possible. Either a town could sort of stay like it was, um, it, or it could become bigger and offer a much wider variety of services to a larger population around. But in doing so, it would then force the other cities around it to become smaller. Um, and so what you really have here is that um, we're on the system stage, you're looking at any one, the size of any one city, but we should have an axis for each, the size of each city. And so as one gets larger, the others are forced to be smaller. So we have the beginning of a, of a hierarchical urban system. And then as more people move into the area and so on, you've got other bifurcations. So you end up with a whole urban hierarchy from the, on the right with the light green, large, largest city in the area, all the way down to the little villages at the bottom. And in the middle there somewhere, you see cities say located at D, which are now all more or less the same in terms of their higher position in the hierarchy, but they came there by very different routes. Some of them grew to get there, some of them declined to get there. Now in uh, a European setting, we might think of something like Brussels, Mechelen, and Antwerp. If we go back 500 years or so, they were all more or less the same. Um, but then as as the population density increased and economic activity increased, as energy use increased, in other words, they began to differentiate. First of all, um, Mechelen sort of dropped out of the picture. It became much less important than Brussels and Antwerp. And at a later date, Brussels became more important than Antwerp. So today we see a real hierarchy there with Brussels as the largest place and most important in Antwerp, secondary, but still important. And Mechelen is sort of a, 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 a has been sort of city between the two. Um, now, um, just to tie in with some of the points that um, uh, Mike Batty made the other day, this we can also think about this as entropy as we're moving to the right because we're putting more energy in the system. We're also moving um, into lower and lower entropy system, uh, a lower and lower entropy system. Um, and this is also called self-organization. The system is organizing itself. I might refer to that as complexity, uh, the, the increasing complexity. Uh, complexity theory and self-organization theory are pretty much the same thing. Um, and I'll tend to use the terms interchangeably. Um, so we can tie this sort of behavior in here with energy use and entropy and negentropy and ultimately information. There's another point here I should mention, which is emergence. Um, and this is what Mike was talking about. And if, as the city, as the system becomes more complex, as more self-organized, as the name self-organized suggests, it's becoming um, a structure is emerging. We see a whole, instead of a, just a bunch of more or less identical towns, we see a whole <laughs> urban hierarchy of different types of cities and different sizes. This is a much more structured system. Um, and this is talked about is emergence. We're, we're looking at the emergence of structure. And this was hailed as a great advance, which it is when people began to think about this um, 30 or 40 years ago, first at uh, uh, Prigogine's work in, in Brussels, and later the Santa Fe Institute in New Mexico. Um, but it's now being recognized by a few people that there's more to emergence than just this. This is what we might call weak emergence. There's another kind of emergence, which we might call strong emergence. And let me just backtrack a moment. When we're talking about these urban systems, we talk, I've been talking about system state as in terms of the size, and that would mean the number of people in the cities, or if we're talking about retail centers, the number of shops or the number of square meters of floor space or numbers of sales. Um, what we're talking about in soft emergence is simply a reorganization of what's already there. The pattern, we're seeing emerging patterns, but they're patterns made up of the same things. But in real human systems, we find, and biological systems, we find new entities emerging. So we do have, in an urban system, we have people 
no, we have businesses. Where do the businesses come from? The, they're collections of people, but they're not just a, an agglomeration like a bunch of people in a crowd. They are actually organized in some way. And the business itself is not just an organization of people. It has its own agency. It can act on its own independently of any of the individual uh, people um, employed by that company. Unless we're talking perhaps about um, Tesla. <laughs> or Elon Musk maybe is the company. Um, but uh, this is, this is a, an idea then of strong emergency. You're creating new types of agents in the system. And that's much more difficult to deal with. And we're just beginning to see how that can be done. I'll come back to that um, shortly. So um, the orthodox science says that theories must be judged by uh, comparing a prediction with an observation. So here's our data. We have a model and it produces two results, um, sort of like the one we saw uh, with Dan Brown. And one of them coincides with the data, but so do we have a bad model or do we have a good model with a bad calibration? Or do we have a good model on good calibration? Well, if reality is like the blue line here, we know we have a bad model. Um, we, well, we don't know if we have a bad model or we have a good model with a bad calibration, but something's wrong with it. But if the reality is like this, we know we have a good model and a good calibration. But the trouble is we don't have any way of knowing this because we don't really know what the underlying system is that, as shown by the bifurcation diagram there. Um, and yet this is a Im very important issue because the um, model, a model with bifurcations, which is what we need, uh, is hard to test. But uh, the, perhaps the major role of the <laughs> model is to allow us to anticipate approaching bifurcations. These are the major events in the history of any city system, the bifurcations. This is where you get fundamental change appearing. And the fundamental change could be for the better, or it could be for the worst, or it could be for a disaster. And so we want these models in order to be able to predict the bifurcations and also give us some indications to when we get to the bifurcation point, how we go the direction we would like to go rather than the bad direction. Um, if we make an error, this is very costly because um, separating the two possibilities in a bifurcation diagram, there's a third possibility, which is the original equilibrium solution to the equations, which is now a repeller. It's um, um, an energy barrier. It takes a lot of work to get from one branch of the bifurcation to the other, a lot of energy. Um, we see this in real cases where cities have decided later they've made a mistake. Uh, this, you see this often with major urban um, highways in Seoul, Korea, for example, where one was removed because it was seen to be a disaster ultimately in the San Francisco, the same thing, but they spent billions of euros to remove those. Um, so it would be much better if they hadn't had to remove them in the first place. Here's a graphic sort of representation this from the film um, Fitzcarraldo where the boat sailed up the wrong branch of the Amazon and they realized it had to get it over to the right branch and so they hauled it over the repeller, the highlands between the two branches. Um, so this is what you want to avoid. Um, so these deep problems are obvious but they're largely ignored. Um, and it, uh, well, I've said most of this, it's these uh, bifurcations that give rise to the indeterminacy of the open futures. But there is this other, other indeterminacy, and that has to do with um, um, uh, the strong emergence um, and the fact that these systems can change themselves. And this gets into the algorithms. The algorithm is really a performance. It exists in time and it has to be executed step by step. Um, algorithms are normally considered to be equivalent to a subset of mathematics, but this is um, true for a subset of algorithms, but that's because they're designed to be equivalent. And this is what Turing was trying to do. But when he proved the whole thing theorem, he showed that there's some algorithms that aren't equivalent to mathematics. And so modelers like mathematicians have, have, and have taken a lot of care to avoid these sorts of algorithms. The trouble is the world that maybe doesn't involve is in fact, it doesn't. The world really thrives on these non-Turing algorithms, the, un, the badly behaving way, because it doesn't hold and we don't want the world to hold. Um, all of our human systems are, 
like all biologic systems, are essentially creative and they undergo um, a continual structural evolution. In other words, they stop being the systems they were and they become somewhat different systems and they continue to change themselves. Um, all these models, uh, systems are actually model based. They contain models of themselves. And these models also can contain relevant aspects of their environment. In other words, these systems are self referential. And because they're self referential, they cannot be represented comprehensively by mathematics. Um, if you try to represent them by mathematics or well behaved algorithms, then you get into the problems of paradox or um, uh, um, non halting algorithms. And this is what panicked Rob Rosen, who was a mathematical biologist who understood very well what was going on, but didn't see the answer because he was convinced that algorithms are equivalent to mathematics and you couldn't have self referential systems in mathematics. But if we have creative systems, then then we have no problem. Uh, the question is, how do we do this? This is where I'm going to come back to another model, a recently developed one, an economic model. Um, because the economic, the economy is a very highly creative system. It um, continually innovates. It has new processes, technologies, products, new organizational structures. And it, if we look at it historically, it's essentially generated so from essentially nothing, people hunting and gathering up to today's incredibly complex global economic system. Um, economic theory, however, is highly mathematical. This is what makes it seem powerful and impressive um, and, and makes people take it seriously. But it's essentially static, and the results always represent equilibrium, which is exactly not what we see in real economic systems. So what would a model of an innovative self-generating economy look like? Um, it would be algorithm, but it wouldn't be a well-behaved algorithm. And so here's the quick model. Um, look at a model. This model is dynamic, first of all, and agent-based. Um, um, we have producer agents who buy products and then um, use a the technology to produce an output. And we have consumer agents that sell their labor and buy products. We have prices that are established by uh, relationship between supply and demand for each product. Agents have some knowledge, but it's a limited knowledge of the state of the economy. And on the basis of that knowledge, they plan their actions on the basis of that knowledge. And they use a simple model of themselves and the economy as part of their planning. So this model, this dynamic model, essentially mirrors the neoclassical theory of macroeconomics, except that it's dynamical. And so here we see a reproduction of a typical result from the classical theory, namely, if you perturb the system, as we get it about iteration 50, it returns to equilibrium, but in a very messy, noisy way. Um, now, here's the algorithmic model of the economy that innovates. We take that dynamic model and embed it in an algorithm that can change it. So this new algorithm now generates new agents as well as new agents with new technologies and therefore new products. Therefore, in a sense, it's generating new variables and new equations. So some existing technologies and products will be uncompetitive, those will disappear from the system. So there's now a metadynamics that involves system size and structure as well as the complexity. And um, here we see some what the results of this sort of model would look like. You see on the left there, there's a crisis in the system around iteration 600. The number of producers using each of the technologies is growing, 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 growing until about 6,000. Then suddenly a lot of them disappear. And if we look at the next two graphs on the right, the number of technologies, the number of products, then we see, well, up until that crisis, the number of new technologies was more or less stable. It, so the economy wasn't really changing. It was just getting bigger, but it wasn't changing. And the number of products didn't change. Um, so, so it was growing, but without any change. And that ultimately led to this crisis. Um, and you see at the crisis point there um, in the lower left on the prices of each product, some of the products at the crisis point had um, surges in the, in the prices. Um, uh, now, these, looking at the structure of this economy, the graphs that show the structure, the initial structure, that's a little bit of a cheat because it wasn't quite this economy, but it's similar. I had the picture. Um, initially, the economy was very simple and had a simple structure. By the time we get to iteration 10,000 here, you see that there are many more um, products and technologies iterated in a more complicated way. And so the economy has, in a sense, generated itself, has generated new products, new processes, new technologies and new relations, and it's become more complex and more productive. We've gone further now recently, we've used genetic programming to, which is a technique that 
it basically uses the cuts and snips pieces of code in a, in a program um, and modifies, but before it pastes between cutting and pasting, it modifies it, it evolves the code in some way. Um, and so you generate a new model from the old model by cutting, modifying, and pasting code. And you can also do this repeatedly too, so the model becomes bigger. Um, and so this, this um, algorithm is rewriting itself as it executes. Uh, and that includes everything from changing the large structure down to changing the structured equations embedded in the model. And we've used this um, technique as in the first experiment to evolve new kinds of agents, as in other words, a strong emergence. Um, and these agents, some of them look, uh, there are composite agents, they're agents that contain agents. This is analogous to um, the, the uh, appearance of multi-celled organisms from single-celled organisms. Um, a a multi-celled organism like us is not just a collection of amoebas, it's got its own structure and its own integrity and its own agency. And so these new agents contain other agents, but they are themselves agents. And in fact, in their structure, they resemble, we can identify them as real things like in the real economy, like co-ops and franchise systems. So this leads us to the discovery of time. Um, what a computer can do um, that mathematics and logic can't do. And it, the reason is that the, the computer can be creative because it's operating in natural time. As we've just seen, um, if we have algorithms that rewrite themselves, they're being creative. Um, now, this would send horrors through the minds of people like Gödel and, and Turing because the whole idea was to make sure that you knew what was happening. This is the certainty that comes from mathematics that we all crave because that's what science is based on, the, the um, ultimate certainty that once we can put everything into mathematical terms, we know that it's true and will remain true. But, what's, but in the real world, it seems things keep changing. And so there's always something else that has to be known because something else is appearing because the universe is creative. And that's what we need to model because we're operating in a creative system, the human system. In fact, our current human system is designed. We make spend vast amounts of money, time and effort making sure that we keep changing, that we have innovation, new products, new technologies. Um, and so the computer can do this because it's operating in natural time. Uh, and the paradox and Turing's halting problem arise from the fact that they're working in a timeless system or trying to work in a timeless system. Once the mathematics is there, it simply is there. Um, now, those mathematical models may include a representation of time like T or DT. Um, this is called spatialized time, and this is essential. It is its own kind of time, and we couldn't do anything. Probably life couldn't represent, couldn't exist without a representation of time. Um, because it allows us to do things like predict, and we do need to predict, even a single cell organism needs to predict where is food and what is an enemy. Um, and so we need this sort of time, but it's not sufficient. We also need natural time. And so to model these evolving systems, strong emergence, we require natural time in our models. And this is provided by the computer as long as we use uh, non-conventional algorithms, those which can modify our, themselves. And we also need these systems to be open to outside perturbations, um, as the real world is. Um, in, in computer modeling, the simplest and easiest type is to simply use a stochastic perturbation. But in open computing, you may have other sorts of outside perturbations. So conclusions. Um, the human systems, the things like cities and economies, are by their nature entirely predictable. Um, are even if they're understood mathematically, they're not, I should say, are not entirely predictable. Um, they're fundamentally evolving systems and therefore have to be understood by means of evolutionary models, that is models that change themselves as they execute. And we need to deal with these deep methodological issues that we largely ignore concerning validation and uh, in the absence of predictivity and the new philosophical issues that are arising, for example, concerning the nature of time or the relationship between natural time and representational time. And here's the fourth one I put in, which sounds much less philosophical than the others. Um, we need a big science to deal with these problems. Other fields in the hard sciences, 
spend billions on particular research projects. We spend dibbles of euros on small projects because that's all we can get. And so we really so far haven't been in a position to tackle these big issues in a comprehensive way because we don't have we don't have the number of people who are working in the area or the finance to make this possible. But if we're to make serious progress on some of these issues, which are fundamentally important ones in understanding and working with human systems that we need for planning of all sorts of human systems, we somehow need to make the transition to something like big science. Okay, um, just to give you a, a, a reference to that, a lot of what I talked about modeling is in this book that we published several years ago. Uh, from MIT Press. And the business of time and algorithm and so on is, uh, you can find that in this paper, which is in the book seen on the right from Astrophysics Under Conventional Computing. It's also available in archive, an archive, which is the same version. Um, or you can just email me if you want a copy. And this, is, this paper is essentially an outline of a book that we're working on, on, the, on um, basically natural time and the role of natural time in the sciences. Um, and in the world. So thank you, and I hope that leaves us some time for discussion. I've not constrained for time, but probably some of you are. So